Okay, we're going to talk about history and physical examination, and I'm going to uh, break this chapter, chapter 7, into two parts. First, we're going to talk about small animal, and then we'll talk about large animal. It's kind of a long chapter, so we'll uh, break it in half, and uh, you can watch this in shorter chunks. First, we're going to talk about getting the history. So there are a couple of different methods in obtaining patient history, and um, it's going to start by you introducing yourself and your position. Uh, when you walk into a room, the client is not going to know who you are and what you do there. You need to be professional uh, with this um, aspect. They need to be able to trust you with their pet. Very often, you're going to be asking them to give up their pet to you in order to take it to a really scary room where they don't know what's going to happen. So you want to make sure that you have a rapport with the client. You need to know the client's name, the pet's name, and really importantly, you need to know that the pet is a girl or a boy. Um, people get a little bit attached to the to the gender of their pet, um, also their pet's name. And so if you have those things in your back pocket um, ready to go, you can really help to develop that rapport with the client. You want to determine the animal signalment. That is the first thing you're going to determine when you look at your even your um, your appointment book for the day. Um, animal signalment is their uh, their breed, uh, their species, um, well, species, breed, their age, uh, their sexual status, sometimes what color they are, uh, and those are the basic information that's going to because we know that certain breeds, certain species, certain ages, um, uh, certain sexual status, th that's all going to give us clues as to what might be bringing the pet in that day. We're going to ask questions in an effective manner. We're going to talk about that um, a little bit. You want to avoid complex medical terminology without belittling the client. So some of your clients that come in, they're going to be neurosurgeons and nurses, and they're going to understand the medical terminology. Um, but you're going to also have um, people come in with a high school uh, diploma or maybe not even a high school diploma. But they, they still may be very bright people. They just don't have the medical terminology. So you want to be able to use the medical words appropriately, but also uh, what we try to do is use the word and then... Um, uh, use a similar term that may be a little bit more um, uh, user-friendly uh, for the client. When you ask questions, please ask open-ended questions. If you ask a yes or no question, people will answer yes or no, and you won't actually get the information that you need. Number one thing, you need to avoid being judgmental of the care and management of the pet because they took the time to put the pet in the car and drive to you or even just pick up the phone and ask a question. So it's it, it takes a lot for people to step outside of their normal social um, realm and, and develop a new relationship. So if they did that, please uh, uh, take the time to acknowledge the fact that they brought the pet in. That means that they cared enough to bring the pet in, and that's really important. Documentation. We've talked about this. You need to be able to document very uh, effectively, and you need to do it with good written communication. Using a standardized history form or standardized physical exam form really helps you to uh, not miss anything pertinent and to keep everything in the same order so you can find things easily. You want to write legibly or type using appropriate medical terminology, and this helps you to document accurate medical history. So the question is, what do standardized forms help you do better? Helps you practice medicine, uh, the quality of medicine better. Helps you not miss things. Um, in your Evolve, if uh, you bought a new uh, book, you should have a, a, a link to the Evolve website. And within that, you will find medical record forms. These medical record forms are available to you to download and print. Um, so you can just pull them up uh, if you have when, when you get to the point where you're making your own medical record. Um, next semester. Um, I just want you to know this is here so that you can go back to it and find uh, this information and follow along with it. So, okay, so signalment, age, breed, or dominant breed if they're mixed, color, and sex and reproductive status. A lot of times you have a neutered male or a neutered female. Those are important things for us to know too. 
background uh, information, uh, general management, how long have this, uh, has this owner had this pet, where and when was it obtained, if they know, uh, previous medical problems, their normal routine, we want to know their last normal, and any recent travel. Have you guys uh, been anywhere uh, with this, this pet in the last however long, or did you bring a, a pet in from a different place? Um, Open-ended questions are really important. Type of food eaten, uh, the amount and frequency, any recent changes in their diet, if they're fed anything unusual, uh, or if they've gotten into something uh, just before the onset of illness. Preventive medicine is their vaccine history, heartworm prevention, flea and tick prevention, and dental care. When was the last time they had a dental cleaning? You need to start talking about dental cleaning. We will be talking about how important dental care is for their pet. Um, are they doing anything at home? Um, have they had a recent dental cleaning? Behavioral information, we want to know what their pet normal behavior is. Is there any changes in behavior? Remember, behavior is super important when relating it to illness uh, and just in general. Um, household information, what is the health status of other pets? Um, any illnesses among humans or family? Any transmittable or infectious illnesses going around the house? Any allergy histories? Uh, we need to know if they've had any allergies or adverse reactions to either medicine or food, because obviously we don't want to give that. Um, and if they've ever had a blood transfusion, because once they've had one blood transfusion, uh, the second one will be more likely to cause an allergic reaction to the, the blood. We also, if they know the blood type, we'd like to know what that is. Reproductive history, we're going to note that during signalment and uh, note their prior reproductive history, record their age of neutered, if they've been neutered or spayed. If they're intact, we have to know when the last heat cycle was for females. We'll talk about how important, how and why that's important to understanding what might be going on with the animal. Pertinent past medical history, any prior medical problems, any historical problems, any serious conditions not have anything to do with the current condition, but it may be pertinent if we need to follow up on it. So there's a lot of questions here. Um, there's a reason why using standardized forms help us, helps us to be uh, better at taking uh, historical information. Most important information is the presenting complaint. This is recent history. Um, this is what is bringing that patient in today. They may have more than one presenting com complaint, but we have to address whatever the client says is the problem with the patient. So for instance, we have this nice um, chunky pug come in. The client says, my dog is limping. And the doctor says, your job is dog is limping because it has too much weight on his joints and the client doesn't understand that the problem may be related to the weight they want to know what you're going to do about the limping how can you how can you fix the limping right now today and they were going to want you to give a shot so they don't have to give medications they want the easiest quickest way and the 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 best way to take care of this pet is going to be the weight but we have to get to that um, we have to deal with the limping issue because that's what's biggest in the client's head and then we need to get to what what may be causing those issues Last normal is a good way to get a sense of the duration of a problem. It's an open-ended question and helps the client recall a pleasant time when the pet was acting normally. It connects that client to the pet in a positive way. It helps us to construct a chronologic timeline. It can be helpful finding a diagnosis. After we know when they were last normal, we want to understand the progression. So um, we may have a problem list, and it, this, help, this progression helps us to determine the order in which each uh, problem appeared and how long each one lasted. We want to ascertain how each pro problem has progressed. So we can um, simplify questions to the client by asking, are the problems, whatever problem they listed, uh, getting better, same, worse, or, this, or are they staying the same? So since the last normal, is the dog drinking more um, every day worse, or is it staying about the same since then? Um, now we go to the next problem. Is the dog limping more or, or less, or is it getting worse or better? Is it about the same since it was last normal? 
what's happening right now okay so our physical exam uh, starts with questions we're going to review our basic body uh, systems and using our standardized form um, questions asked about each system are going to provide information um, that might otherwise be overlooked by the owner remember you're trained to look at the whole animal they are not so they they're they're going to tell you about presence of coughing sneezing vomiting diarrhea polyuria, dips, polydipsia, that's uh, increased urination, increased drinking. Um, and you need to ask those questions specifically. Now, you they may bring a pet in for vomiting or diarrhea. Um, and you may be following along the lines of, well, it might be this, this, or this. If you ask them about coughing, well, they were coughing three weeks ago or two or last week or something like that. That's actually really important information. Let me tell you why. A dog that is vomiting and diarrhea because of parasites will have coughed a couple of days to a couple of weeks beforehand because what they're doing is in the life cycle of the parasite, they're coughing up the baby parasites, the larvae, and they're then swallowing, they're coughing up from the lungs, swallowing them back down, and uh, then they're causing problems in the intestinal tract. So those little bits of information can be super important. We're also going to question the current appetite and energy level and then note any perceived weight loss or weight gain. We're going to talk about taking a body condition score on the pet every time they come in. Weight is, is somewhat subjective based on the, the, the breed, but a body condition score never lies. It's kind of like a body a, a BMI in a person. A weight can be subjective based on how much muscle mass versus um, uh, fat mass uh, in a, a person has, but BMI is what what we're looking at basically. Current medications, uh, we need to know type, dose, and frequency for each medication. It's always best to just have them bring in their current medications because they will tell you it's the yellow pill. You know the yellow pill, and it's small, and I give it I don't know how many times a day. So have them bring it in. We'll be able to look at that. Um, how long have they been giving? Why they've been giving it? Is it working? Um, are they also giving any supplements or vitamins? A lot of people give supplements to their dogs that may tell us what's going on. Are they using topical medications or medicated shampoos, ear medications? We want to uh, know all preventive medications, heartworm and flea stuff that they're using as well. With our physical examination, we need to follow a consistent routine that helps us to prevent overlooking any important finding. So we're going to go from the tip of the nose to the tip of the tail. We do it the same way every time. Now, if you have a client complaint and the owner is super specific about it's an ear infection, it's an ear infection. You can take a look at the ear first, but then say, you know what, I want to look at his whole body. You're here for an exam, I'm going to give you the full exam. So you want to perform all aspects of the examination in the same order for every patient. It's less likely that you're going to miss something if you do it that way. So every system, every time. You're going to document using a standardized physical exam form, record the information legibly, use proper medical terminology, keep the content professional, and document in as much detail as possible. Now a lot of times when we are using proper medical terminology, we're actually using acronyms um, that allow us to uh, keep the record uh, short and to the point. Um, so we're, we're keeping it professional, but we're using terminology, acronyms that are part of the terminology uh, that are used frequently. For instance, B-A-R, bright, alert, responsive. We add an H to that, B-A-R-H, bright, alert, responsive, hydrated. That's very easily telling us that we have a fairly normal looking pet that is normally hydrated. And so we don't have to put all those words in, we just put the acronym in. Surroundings. Observe the patient in its surroundings before the physical examination. This is especially important if you're in um, uh, if, if you're in an area that is not the, the clinic setting. Um, when you're evaluating the surroundings, you can evaluate how clean it is, um, if there's food or water around the vicinity. Um, but you also want to know what the patient is doing behavior-wise before you approach it. You want to note its mentation. Is it normal? Um, are they paying attention to you or, or the owner? Note the respiratory rate and respiratory effort before you stress it out. 
visual deficits when the patient walks, and then note their body condition score. And we're going to talk a lot about body condition score later, but it's basically um, looking at them, looking at how much fat they have around the ribs, around the waist, and being able to score them based on on the way they look versus and feel the way versus their weight. Temperature, pulse, and respiration. So beyond signalment, that's one of your first vital signs um, to find. You have to know your normals. So temperature, pulse, and respiration for a for a dog, large dog, small dog, for a cat. Um, you have to have that in your head. Um, you need to record this in a dedicated area on a standard physical exam, fi exam fi finding. These are the first things that we're going to see. Okay, I do have a YouTube video for here for you to watch on how to get a uh, pulse as you're getting a uh, you know as you're trying to feel for a pulse um, for body temperatures. There are a couple of different ways that we do this. Uh, using a digital thermometer is probably the the first and easiest way. You want to use lubrication and probe covers to keep everything clean and lubricated as you do it. Uh, it's uncomfortable but not painful. If they're screaming in pain, there may be either something wrong or they're just not used to it. Sometimes it's just a socialization thing. It's a um, feeling of discomfort versus pain. Um, there are aural thermometers. They're not as accurate as rectal thermometers. Um, using a mercury thermometer is not used as much anymore just because it takes a lot longer to do. When we're using arterial pulses, which artery? Do you know which artery we use in small animals? Well, typically we'll, what we'll use is the femoral pulse which you can find by feeling on the inside of the thigh of the animal. This is a picture of somebody <coughs> listening to or auscultating the heart while they are feeling the femoral pulse. So they have their hand wrapped around the inner thigh and they've got a finger, not a thumb, because your, your thumb uh, also has a pulse uh, and you're just going to press it lightly. Uh, if they're a little bit heavier, you're going to have to press a little bit heavier because there's fat in between there. Um, lightly on the, the right in the center of the inner thigh, and you should be able to feel pulse. If you have an animal in the uh, at home, I would definitely recommend that you try to feel it. What is a pulse deficit? A pulse deficit is where you are listening to the heart and you are feeling the pulse, and there is not a pulse for every heartbeat. So you should hear a thump and then feel a, a beat, thump beat, thump beat, thump beat. And the smaller the animal is, the closer that thump and the beat will be together. Um, the larger they are, the longer it's going to take for that thump of the heart to get to the pulse of the limb. So thump beat, thump beat, thump beat. Um, sometimes it's at the same time. Okay. Uh, if you feel a thump or hear a thump or a lub dub, and you do not feel a beat uh, in the pulse area, uh, that means you have a pulse deficit. There is not a corresponding pulse with every heart beat. That means that the uh, blood has not moved with enough force to get to the pulse area. So that's called a pulse deficit. Respiratory rate and effort you want to observe before you even touch them. Respiratory rates are usually counted visually first, followed by auscultation. So that means listening to the lung sounds everywhere on the chest. Um, you will cap calculate both pulse and respiratory rate based per minute. And typically what we're doing is we are counting um, for a, a period of time. The longer that you count, the more... Um, the more likely you are to get a, an accurate count. Um, typically, we will count for six to ten seconds because it does it it does take a while to to uh, get that um, count. And if you're counting for a full minute, that can be that can take more time than you really have. So we'll count for uh, six to ten minute uh, ten seconds. If we're counting for six seconds, we're going to take that number and multiply it by ten. If we're counting for um, uh, 10 seconds, we're going to take that number and multiply it by 6. Okay, so we're going to calculating it by, by minute, and you should know your normals. Um, respiratory effort is how much do, are they working to 
take in a breath or push out a breath. You should evaluate both bringing a breath in and pushing a breath out. With our physical exams, it's going to start, like I said, tip of the nose. So we're going to look at the nose, we're going to open them, and then oropharyngeal, we're going to look in the mouth. We're going to look at the teeth and the gums under the tongue, the tongue in the back of the mouth. Um, should be fairly easy to do just by lifting the lips. It depends on the animal, of course. Uh, there are some animals that we can't even lift the lips. Um, some animals we can open their mouths and stick our fingers in the back of their their. Uh, mouth, mouth and, and, and or lift, lift up their, their tongue. tongue. One, One good, good way, way to get, get a tongue to lift up is to press underneath the, the mandible on the outside, press, press up in that soft spot in between the bones, and that, that will cause the tongue to rise. rise. So, so there are uh, common, common diseases of the oral cavity that can cause a loss of appetite, difficult to chewing, drooling, or halitosis, which is bad breath. Um, this is um, resorptive lesions along the teeth of a cat, and you can see really soft and uh, reddened gum tissue here and some loss of tooth here. Uh, this is some growth in the mouth of a dog and also some pretty nasty uh, periodontal disease here. Um, and this is looking under the tongue of a cat. This is an area where we often find string foreign bodies or masses, and so it's really important to look under the tongue. Once uh, we've looked at the nose and the mouth, um, we're looking for drainage in the nose and the ability to breathe uh, appropriately from the nose and any uh, changes in the pigmentation of the nose. With the eyes, uh, this is really important. Um, I diseases can get bad very, very quickly, and so we want to look at the eyes pretty carefully. We're going to look initially at the uh, nictating membrane, which is the third eyelid. This is this portion here that can come over the eye even when the eye is open. It is typically not vis visible or only partially visible. If you see it, it's abnormal. If it's sticking halfway over the eye, that is abnormal. Um, if it's not visible and you want to take a look at it, if you gently press with the lid over the eyeball, you press, you put the lid over the eyeball, not your finger, if you gently press on the globe, the eyelid, the third eyelid will come out. You want to look for any swelling, redness, masses, or foreign material on that third eyelid. You want to assist the, vis the patient's visual status. Can they see out of both eyes? You want to inspect for any redness, swelling, masses, or abnormal hair growth. Sometimes they will get eyelashes that grow into uh, their um, cornea and scratch their cornea. Inspect the cornea. Normal, a normal cornea will be clear, won't have any pigment on it, um, and it will be moist. Um, you want to look for any cloudly, cloudiness or pig, precipitates or pigment in the cornea or in the eye itself. We shouldn't see this cloudiness here. Um, so there are a number of common abnormal findings that we'll discuss later, but if it look, doesn't look normal, you need to say something. After we look at the external eye, we're going to look internally. And usually we need to do this with a piece of equipment, a, sh a very um, bright light and a magnifying glass in some way. Um, we can look at the iris, which is around the colored portion around the pupil. The pupil is that opening into the back of the eye. Um, with special equipment, we can see the lens behind the pupil, and the um, we uh, can visualize the anterior chamber, which is in between the iris uh, and the cornea. Um, so specialized equipment, um, usually used by a veterinary ophthalmologist, you will see the retina, which is the back of the eye, the posterior chamber uh, behind the lens, the optic nerve, and the retinal vessels. Here is uh, somebody using, this is actually an otoscope. They're not using the ophthalmoscope portion of it, but they're using a bright light to look at the eye and this magnifying glass. We want to uh, pay attention to the pupillary light response. Um, this tells us a nervous condition is occurring if one pupil is larger than the other. The reason for this is the pupils are connected by their optic nerves and they cross each other and meet in the brain. Uh, or before the brain, actually. And what happens is if you shine the light into one eye, the uh, opposite pupil should contract. So when you, when you go into a bright room, your pupils contract. Both pupils should contract at the same time. When they don't, that means that one eye is damaged in some way. 
Um, so in this eye, this is called anisocoria, A-N-I-S-O-C-O-R-I-A. Anisocoria indicates that we have one pupil that is larger than the other. Now looking at this cat, it we cannot tell if this eye is abnormal or this eye is abnormal. We have to do further tests to, to tell that. But this is an abnormal uh, look for this um, eye. If we have the PLR or the pupillary light response, this reflex is not normal. That means we have damage to the nervous system somewhere along the optic nerve. The lens is not visible without the specialized equipment. Um, this is a large magnifying glass um, that is used uh, to see into the back of the eye. What you're seeing here in this magnifying glass is the retina, the very back of the eye. Within that retina, the, the shiny part is called the tapetum lucidum. That tapetum lucidum is what reflects light back so that when you shine a light on animals' eyes in the darkness, you see a reflection back. That's the tapetum lucidum. It allows them to collect more light in the eye so they can see better in the dark. This uh, here, this black spot here, is the optic nerve, and it has blood vessels running to it. This is a great way to visualize the nervous system without having to look actually at the nervous system, without other ways of uh, doing it. So during a physical exam, it's one way to actually look at a nerve. We can also see what's happening with uh, smaller blood vessels in the back of an eye. If we see really congested smaller blood vessels in the back of the eye, we know that we probably have high blood pressure throughout the body. Um, we can also see the lens um, if we are, depending on what magnification we're using, if we pull the magnification out a little bit, we can actually see the lens as well. If we see more opacity in the lens than normal, um, there are two reasons that, are cause, that cause this. One is kind of a scarring down. It's called nuclear sclerosis, and it happens in pets that are seven years or older. Pets that are seven years or older, what is happening is that lens is growing continuously. The lens grows continuously uh, in, in the shape of kind of an onion. So if you're cutting up an onion, you look at it, the inner circle is much smaller and denser than the outer circles. And that's how the lens grows. As it grows continuously, um, the lens will get denser and denser and denser. So it will be less likely to allow light to move through it, which means it will become opaque. Dogs that are seven years or older, you will start to see this opaqueness. This will cause the dog to need to, at this age, use glasses when it's reading the newspaper. Um, I say that kind of in a joking way, um, but that's typically what's happening as we age as humans as well. And that's why at the age of about 40, uh, we need reading glasses in order to see better. With a cataract formation, that's an abnormal uh, finding where the... Um, the, the proteins that make up the lens kind of coagulate together and they create uh, something that is un they're unable to see through. So uh, somebody, uh, somebody with cataracts will tell you that uh, seeing through a cataract is kind of like um, being in a car that is covered with snow and you can see light and dark and, and shadows moving around but you can't really see details. Moving on to the ear or aural examination, um, we're wanting to look at the um, ear pinna. So we want to look and see if we have any swelling or, or um, signs of um, bleeding or, or punctures on the ear pinna. Uh, we want to inspect the inside and the outside of the ear for swelling, redness, alopecia, crusting, and evidence of excoriation. That would excoriation be scratches, um, abrasions, etc. Um, we're going to lift back the pinna to ex uh, inspect the external ear canal uh, visually and evaluate for any discharge, thickness, swelling, or masses. The ear canal goes down and then into the ear. The eardrum is all the way down at this horizontal, not the vertical canal, but in the horizontal canal. So when we are looking in an ear, we actually, when we use an otoscope with a cone, we actually need to stick the cone vertically down and then bend everything down and look at it horizontally in order to visualize that tympanic membrane. It is something that I rec uh, recommend that you start to practice doing. It's typically something that a veterinarian can do, but a veterinary technician is permitted to do this and should be comfortable doing it. So we've done the 
Um, well, we've looked at the nose. I'm going to go over the nose again, more specifically with pictures. Uh, we've done the mouth, and we've done the ears, and we've done the eyes. Um, looking at the nose, we're looking at the upper respiratory tract. We're going to look at the nares for symmetry, patency, make sure they're open, and normal size. Um, loading uh, nasal discharge and making sure that they look the same on both sides and they're both open. Um, if we have discharge from the nose, we need to note the severity and character of the discharge. So is it mild, moderate, or severe? Is it coming out both uh, um, nostrils at the same time? Is it serous, mucoid, purulent, or hemorrhagic? Um, and then uh, this is a uh, Boston Terrier that has what we call stenotic or narrowed nares. This is normal, unfortunately, because it's been bred into them with this short face to have really small uh, openings to their nose. This is a surgical correction. So this is the nares have been uh, surgically resected and sutured up so that we have When an animal is having an upper respiratory tract infection or blockage, they are going to have trouble breathing lower respiratory uh, tract infection or the or um, uh, chest within the chest, they're going to have trouble breathing out and that's pneumonia or something within the chest. So we need to listen to that lower chest. We want to eliminate any environmental noise if we can. Gently close the patient's mouth if they're panting or quiet. To quiet a cat's purring, you may move the trachea just off to the side or if you run water a little, stop them from purring. And try to listen through there and then listen to the lungs on both sides of the chest, usually in nine different quadrants on each side so listening a lot of different places we want to listen as they breathe two or three times and listen to the inspiration versus the expiration again inspiration difficulty means upper respiratory tract expiration difficulty means lower respiratory tract lung sounds are going to be a little bit different depending on whether you're listening to a really thin pet or a really overweight pet. Uh, you want to be able to hear air movement uh, both through inspiration and expiration with really minimal intensity. Um, it's going to be it's going to be variable depending on their condition. You're not going to be able to hear it much uh, when you have this much fat on a pet. With a cardiovascular examination, it starts with our mucous membrane and CRT, or capillary refill time. So our abbreviation for that is MM slash CRT, and normal would be pink and less than two seconds. Um, this helps us to assess perfusion status, meaning how does the heart pumping get the blood to the, to the extremities of the body. So first we're going to lift the lip and look at the gingival mucous membrane color and make sure it's moist. If it's not moist, it could be that they haven't had anything to drink for a little while, or it could mean that they're dehydrated. If they are pale, that means that we don't have blood flow or enough red blood cells uh, in the blood. If they are hyperemic, meaning more redness of the mucous membranes, that can usually mean that they are either very, very hot or have a septicemia or bacterial infection of the bloodstream. If they have dry or tacky mucous membranes, um, that means that they are dehydrated. Um, checking the capillary refill time um, is uh, when you push on the, uh, the, the pink tissue, the gum, and allow it to blanch. So you're stopping blood flow just for a second and you let go and you should see that whiteness disappear within two seconds. And that's the capillary refill time. Normal is less than two seconds. Then you want to auscultate the heart. You want to evaluate for abnormal heart rate, rhythm, and sounds. Um, to listen to a canine heart, you're going to listen on both sides of the chest. And for the the cat, you're going to listen on the sternum and just move it side to side. There are murmurs or odd sounds that happen on the left side versus the right side. And if you're able to hear it on one side versus the other, it can really tell us what's going on. So if you hear an abnormal sound, and I've got a, a video here and I've pulled it out for you in your eLearn shell, an odd sound can tell you um, what you, uh, when you hear an odd sound that's not just a strict lub-dub, it will tell you what's going on with the heart.
And it's not important at this point that you re recognize what's going on, but just hearing that abnormal is very important. You want to evaluate the heart rhythm. The rhythm should be regular, and each heartbeat should be separated from the following one by an identical time and interval. However, with dogs, there are times when there is a normal arrhythmia. It's called a sinus arrhythmia, and it happens as they're breathing. So it'll be associated with their breathing. As they breathe in, their heart rate will increase, and as they breathe out, their heart rate will slow down. So if you're hearing a beat, 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 beat. That's, That's regular. regular. It's, it's irregular, irregular but, but it's regularly irregular. irregular. So, so that is a normal sinus arrhythmia with a dog. Um, it's not normal for the cat. Um, every other uh, pet should have a normal rhythm, beat, 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 like a metronome. You want to check for pulse deficits as well. So remember, listen and feel at the same time. It should be a pulse for every beat. Um, any abnormal rhythms should have an ECG, and it's not super important that you remember how to set up an ECG right at this period at this point. But we're going to go over this a couple times so you remember: smoke over fire, and white is right. Um, so or right is white. Um, so on the left side, black over red, smoke over fire. On the right side, you'll have the white one, and there's a green grounding wire that goes on the back right leg. This is, these are just charts um, showing how EKGs are made through an, um, measuring the electrical stimulation um, through the heart and how we can associate uh, the, heart, the electrical stimulation with what's going on exactly within the heart. With a gastrointestinal uh, examination, what we're doing is we're feeling, a palpita we're palpating, not palpitating. Palpitation, and I just say this because it's common for people to misunderstand this word, a palpitation is an abnormal heart rhythm. A abdominal palpation is when we follow uh, using our fingers or our hands, we, we uh, press within the abdomen and can feel different organs. You want to use a consistent routine so you don't miss anything, just like with everything else we do. You need to know where ab um, the abdominal organs should be so you know if they're not in the right place. Um, and you should be able to tr you should try to feel for the liver, which is usually tucked up behind the rib cage. So you don't often feel. If you feel, it's usually abnormal. Um, you might be able to, might or might not be able to feel the spleen. You should be able to, with a thin dog and the and cat, feel the kidneys, um, intestinal tract, and possibly stomach, which is also tucked up underneath the um, ribs, and then the bladder. Bladder is important to be able to feel as well. Um, you should be able to um, uh, divide this animal into six quadrants, into craniodorsal, craniodorsal, mid-dorsal, mid-ventral, uh, mid or caudal dorsal and caudal ventral, and this and left and right halves, because uh, this will help you to understand what you're feeling where. Sometimes you can also feel the prostate, but we usually do that with a rectal exam on male patients, especially intact male patients. Um, this is really important to do a urogenital exam if they're uh, sexually intact, um, if there's a, a problem with the urinary system as well. Um, we will do a abdominal and or rectal palpation in order to evaluate them, especially with the canine distal urethral evaluation. Uh, the male um, obviously has a penis that comes out with a female. Their urethra is within their uh, vagina. The skin, um, this can be one of the most frustrating things for clients to deal with because for um, skin conditions and we have to test every time they come in uh, for different skin conditions because they can have any one of these causes anytime. So when we're looking at the skin or the integument that includes hair, skin, uh, including foot pads and nails and subcutaneous tissue, the hair coat should be thick and shiny throughout. Um, any abnormal hair coats indicates a skin disease or an internal disease uh, that include parasites, or hormones. We want to evaluate the coat for areas of thinning or alopecia. Alopecia means hair loss. We also want to look for means they've been grooming or scratching at the fur and they're breaking the hairs and that hair will feel very rough uh, versus a smooth, thick 
uh, shiny kind of coat. We want to examine alopecic area for evidence of excoriation, so scratches or ulcerations for underlying disease. And we also want to, if we even if we have good hair coat, we want to parasites like fleas. This is an example of generalized alopecia throughout the, the body. Um, it's not symmetrical. I mean, it's symmetrical, but it's asymmetrical because it's all over the body. This is a symmetrical alopecia across the dorsum of the body. And there's hyperpigmentation here too. So that indicates that it's either been going on for a long time and or it's a hormonal issue. We also need to, as we're petting the dog and feeling through the skin and the coat, we want to evaluate the lymph nodes. For the most part, you shouldn't be able to feel lymph nodes very well, um, but you should be able to feel them like little beans. Um, the ones that we want to be able to uh, feel are the medial iliac, which are uh, up underneath the groin, in the groin area of the pet, underneath the legs, mandibular, or submandibular, which will be back behind the mandible, prescapular, which will be in front of the shoulders, popliteal, which are behind the knees, uh, axillary, which will be underneath the armpits, and then uh, inguinal, which will be again underneath um, but a little further back um, from the medial iliac lymph nodes. Musculoskeletal examination actually starts when they walk in the client, into the clinic or into the room. Um, we want to watch them stand and make sure they're standing firmly on all four limbs. You can actually see if, uh, if they're not putting all, all weight on all four limbs. Um, then we want to gently palpate over each limb in the vertebral column and neck and back, and then palpate limbs um, on both sides to compare both legs. We want to note any swelling or pain. Um, this is an example of a dog that is um, not bearing weight on its rear limb. It's not putting its full weight down on its all, all pads of its rear limb. Um, this is an example of a dog, a uh, small dog, that is being evaluated for its kneecap. Small dogs have tend to have a luxating kneecap, and so this veterinarian is extending the limb and palpating the kneecap. For the nervous system evaluation, um, you can do this basically at this point. We'll discuss it more in the fall. But with ner the nervous system, it, it's basically do they look normal? Does their, do their muscles look normal? Are they walking normal? Are they acting normally? So we're evaluating their mentation, their gait, their posture, their muscle tone, cranial nerves um, based on, you know, do the, does their facial um can they blink? Can they smell? Can they see? Can they um, can they taste? Does their tongue work normally? And their different reflexes. And we'll go over this in more um, uh, more detail in the fall. Um, uh, the extent of the nerve, uh, and 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 uh, primarily we're going to be going over this in um, our. Uh, comparison, comparative anatomy and physiology course. Um, the extent of the neurologic exam really varies on the patient and the presenting complaint. It does start with a cranial nerve exam and we and then assesses postural reactions, reflexes, sensation, something we call conscious proprioception, meaning they know where their feet are or their body parts are at any given time. They can can um, uh, put them in the proper location. Uh, uh, normal patients don't always get a nervous system evaluation. You might do a real quick one. Um, when we have uh, patients that are showing signs of disease, we'll do some reflex testing, some forelimb reflexes, withdrawal reflex, hind limb reflex, cutaneous trunk eye reflex, which is just pinching the skin, make sure that twitches normally, and then a perineal reflex, which you do all the time. You don't realize doing it when you're taking the temperature. They should squeeze their anus around that thermometer, and that's a normal reflex. Basically, you're just looking at, does the pet act, look and act normally? If it doesn't, if it looks weird to you, bring that to the doctor's attention. We are going to stop right there um, and take a break and have you start uh, part two with a large animal uh, lecture in when you're ready in just a moment.